Hi, this is Jerry Pinter. Welcome to part three of our video on chapter three. In this part of the lecture, we'll look at the properties of LTI systems. So let's look at a list of some of the major properties of LTI systems. The first one, we actually um, introduced this in the last video, um, is the commutative property. And um, a commutative property just means that if we reverse the orders of operation, um, we get the same result. So we're talking about here convolution. So for an LTI system, it doesn't matter if we do the convolution of X with H or the convolution of H with X, we get the same result. And this works for both continuous time and for discrete time. So in general, A convolution B is equal to B convolution A. The second property is the distributive property. So suppose we have a uh, system here where we have the input signal x of t is um, being convolved with the sum of h1 and h2 from two different subsystems. Well, what we can do here, what distributive property means is that we can simply distribute this x inside the square brackets. So we get x convolution h1 plus x convolution h2. So let's see what this means um, in a block diagram. So when we look at the expanded form right here, we have a system here, h1, that has x as its input. And to that, we're adding another system here, h2, which has the same input x, and it produces some output y2. And we're basically adding these two outputs together to give us the overall uh, system output. So these are um, two subsystems in parallel. Now, what this left side of this equation means is that notice H1 and H2 can simply be added together and treated as a single system here with the input X of T. So this diagram up here is exactly equivalent to this one here we have basically done a, a system simplification. We've taken two subsystems in parallel and combined them together into a single system that has an impulse response equal to the sum of the two impulse responses up here, H1 plus H2. Now, the, uh, there's another property that lets us do something a little different. This is the associative property. And the associative property says that X convolution with H1, and notice in brackets, with the result of that convolution with H2 is equal to X convolution with the convolution of H1 and H2 in brackets. So in other words, where we put these brackets or parentheses doesn't matter in this um, convolution here. Okay, so this is the associative property. And of course, you know, the associative property works with other things too, like addition. So let's see how, what this has to do with systems. So let's take a look at this um, system configuration. Remember, this is called a series system configuration. We've got two subsystems here in series. Our input signal or sequence, X of N, comes in here, goes into the first system, H of one. Let's let the output be called W of N, okay? Now, W of N, of course, is the convolution of H1 and X, all right, by the convolution uh, principle. This, however, W of N becomes the input of H2. So the output of this system is equal to the input of this second system, which is W, convolution with H2. But we know that W down here is, the, is likewise the convolution of X and H1. So we can replace the W here with X convolution H1. And then by using the associative property, we can take these two parentheses and move them around the H's. So what that says is we've got a single system here um, with X going in and the system acts as if it has a single impulse response given by the convolution of H1 and H2. So here is uh, the way to simplify a series type system. Um, when we have two subsystems in series, we can simplify this and make it a single subsystem or a single system. And the impulse response is equal to this impulse response, H1, convolution with the second impulse response here. 
Okay, now um, we can go a step further. We can now use the commutative property and we can reverse the order. Instead of H1 convolution H2, we can say that's equal to H2 convolution H1 by the commutative property. And then working backwards, going from here, kind of like we went from two subsystems to one, we're gonna go from this one and split it apart into two. Notice the difference now is we have H2 first and H1 second. So we've proven two things here. We've shown that whenever we have a system with two subsystems in series, we can combine those by using convolution of the impulse responses. We can do another thing. We can reverse the order of these two systems and it makes no difference. In other words, the order of a series system is not important. So um, the, most of the remainder of what we're gonna do here um, are a bunch of activities. So let's start with this one here. Um, the question is, what is the overall impulse response H for this system shown here? So notice this system um, is a combination of series and parallel subsystems. So in order to figure out you know, what you wanna do, our goal is to simplify all of this stuff, all four of these subsystems, and put them all together as a single systems uh, with, with a, a given impulse response. Now, how do you find the impulse response? Well, you're gonna have to use the distributive and associative properties. So go ahead and pause the video. Um, you might, you'll probably need to look back at the previous slides um, to see how to use the distributive and associative properties to handle both series and parallel subsystems. So here's the solution to the activity. Uh, basically what you do is you can, you know, this kind of reminds me of working on circuits with resistors, how you can simplify the circuit. So let's start in here and we notice that there are two systems here in series. Well, H2 and H3 are in series, so we know that um, we can combine those together to get H2 convolution with H3, all right? That's one of the, the properties from the previous slide. And then that H2 and H3 together are in parallel with H4. So remember, we just add a parallel system. So we have plus H4. And then all of this is in series with H1. And so remember, again, with series systems, we have to take the convolution. So I have H1 out here, convolution with, in brackets, H2 convolution H3 plus H4. So this is the overall simplification of um, all of these subsystems working together here. We can combine them all into a single system that has this for an impulse response. The next property we're gonna look at is causality. And this is something we actually touched on real briefly back in chapter one. So we're gonna look at a little more formal definition of causality um, here in chapter two. So an LTI system is causal if its output depends only on past or present values of its input. So therefore its impulse response must be of the following form. The impulse response of a causal system has to occur at or after zero. Um, the reason for this is because the impulse occurs at zero. So if this system is causal, the output can't happen before the input arrives, okay? So that's the definition of a causal system. So all we have to do is check that the impulse response is zero for everything to the left of zero. Um, this is an example of a discrete time causal system. Here is an example of a continuous time causal system. Notice again, the impulse response only goes to the right of zero. There's no response to the left. So here's uh, an activity. Um, take a look at this system here. You're given this input here, and you're given this output here. Um, your task is to determine if this system is causal or acausal. So again, please pause the video and see if you can figure this out on your own. So the solution here is, um, the, the answer is it is an acausal system. And there's two ways to think about this. The simplest way to think about it is the input doesn't show up until uh, two here, 
and the output is showing up at zero. So obviously the output is preceding or coming before the input. So that would be an A causal system. Uh, more formally, we could take this input here and I could shift it um, to the left by, um, by two. I could shift it over here to zero. So this would be, you know, X of N plus two would be our input now, which is a delta function. And, but I have to shift the output over to also. So you can see here, the impulse response here is showing up before zero, and that by definition makes it acausal. The last um, topic or uh, system property that we're gonna talk about here uh, in this video is stability. So an LTI system is stable if any bounded input produces a bounded output. Since the output depends on the convolution of the input and the impulse response, then um, remember that convolution is either a sum in discrete time or an integral in continuous time. So this is our formal condition for stability. For discrete time, the impulse response has to be absolutely summable. And what absolutely means is, notice these, this is the absolute value of all of the values of the impulse response. When we add them all up, it has to be summable. In other words, it has to be less than infinity, okay? Um, another way to say this is the sum of the impulse response has to converge to some number. In the continuous time case, we use an integral because remember uh, convolution is described by an integral. So in this case, we say the integral has to be, or the um, impulse response has to be absolutely integrable. And again, notice that it's the magnitude or the absolute value of the impulse response um, when integrated, or think about the area under the curve of the impulse response has to be less than infinity. So let's finish up this um, video with um, five examples that you can work through. So for each of the five signals um, shown here, I'm sorry, these are uh, each of the five impulse responses that are shown here. Um, three of them are discrete time, H of N, and these two down here are continuous time impulse responses, H of T. But for each of these, see if you can determine if the system is stable or unstable. And in order to figure this out, you know, use the results on the last slide, which says you either have to look for this to be absolutely summable or absolutely integrable. So um, again, please pause the video and try and see if you can uh, figure these out on your own, and then we'll discuss the answers. So let's go through these um, activities one at a time. So the first one, our impulse response H of N was three fourths to the nth power times the step function U of N. So if I were to plot this, it would look something like this. Starting at zero, there would be some value here, one, and it would basically decay um, as, as follows. Now, how do we know if we can sum this thing up? Because this thing goes to infinity after all. Well, the easiest way to do it is remember from math class, when you study uh, infinite series, there's something very handy called the infinite sum formula. And we're gonna see this um, infinite sum formula you know, over and over again in this course, it's very useful. It says that the sum from n equals zero to infinity of alpha to the n is equal to one over one minus alpha for all values of alpha such that the absolute value of alpha is less than one, okay? So in our um, example here, we have the infinite sum of n equals zero to infinity. We're gonna add up all these values here, three fourths to the n. So using this here, alpha is obviously three fourths. So we have one minus, I'm sorry, one over one minus three fourths one minus three fourths is just one fourth. And so one over one fourth is four. And so obviously this is less than infinity. So therefore our system is stable. For the next activity example, we had H of N is equal to three fourths to the N, but notice there's no step function. So this thing, you know, it decays to the right, but to the left, it blows up. It gets bigger and bigger as, as N becomes more and more negative. So in this case, you know, you can, you can obviously tell, you don't even have to worry about the right side. Just look at the left side. This thing's gonna keep growing and growing and growing, and it's gonna go to infinity. So this is therefore an unstable system. 
The third activity solution uh, was the impulse response h of n is equal to 3 to the n times the step function u of n. And again, if you were to plot this thing, you know, 3 to the nth power, obviously that's going to get very big very fast because we're raising the number 3 uh, to, you know, some power. And so this thing is going to go to infinity and therefore the sum of the impulse response likewise is going to be infinite. So this represents an unstable system. Now let's look at the um, uh, continuous time examples. So the first one was h of t is equal to pi times the step function u of t. So let's make a sketch of this uh, impulse response. The impulse response is zero until we get to time zero, and then it jumps up to pi, you know, 3.141, and it's just steady from there on. There's no time dependence. So um, remember the definition of stability is that this impulse response has to be absolutely integrable. In other words, the area under this curve has to be less than infinity. Well, you can see that this thing, since it goes, you know, keeps going and going and going to the right, it has an infinite area. So this is an unstable system. So, you know, if you look at this, you might argue, well, wait a minute, it's not unstable because it's just staying at at pi the whole time. It's not blowing up to infinity. Well, it doesn't have to. Um, a stable system basically decays. Um, it really has to decay to zero at some point in time. Um, our last uh, example was the impulse response h of t is equal to cosine of 2t times the uh, step function u of t. So let's make a quick plot of this. Here's a cosine function like this. Now, um, if you might argue at first, well, wait a minute, the area under the curve, these are positive areas up here, but these are negative areas down here. So wouldn't they cancel and go to zero, meaning this is a stable function? Well, no, because remember, we have to have these absolute value signs here. We're taking the absolute value of this function, which is shown down here. And when we take the area under the curve, which is the shaded region here, since this thing keeps going and going and going, Obviously, our uh, integral is approaching infinity, and so this represents a, uh, another unstable system. So um, there we got to see in this video uh, some of the properties of LTI systems. We will continue on with the next part of this video soon. Goodbye.